I want to thank you for joining us on the second Tuesday in the season of Easter. It is a week of weeks, and we're so privileged to be in that time of new hope and new life and resurrection. Today we'll be looking at the Office of Keys, and you might say, what in the world is that? Well, we're going to tell you in a minute, but we're going to start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for your blessings, for being with us this day, for this wonderful season of Easter, and we pray that you continue to be with you. Uh, the words of my mouth, this meditation of all those hearts that are here watching today, that you might inspire them of what it means to have the office of the keys. We continue to pray for our world because we know our entire world is struggling with this pandemic that's been going on. We just ask your healing to be upon people who are struggling. We pray for our doctors, our nurses, all who put their lives at risk. That includes people in the grocery store, the cashiers, and the people stocking shelves, and the men and women who drive truck and just continue to keep them safe. We thank you for the provision for all of our farmers who work so hard for us and for our behalf. And may you continue to bless and be with them. And we ask your healing to be upon this world, that we might be restored to productivity once again, that we might continue to bless one another. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, I do want to thank you for that. I mentioned again uh, about the needs in our community about food. There are many members of our community that are struggling to make ends meet. Many have been laid off. Many just don't have sufficient income at this point to put food on their table. And so we are asking for your help on Wednesday uh, from noon until 2 p.m. And then on Thursday from 5 o'clock till 7 p.m. We will uh, be accepting food donations. You're welcome to come down to the church, the side door to the fellowship hall. I will have the door propped open. You don't have to touch anything except for the bags you bring in. Just come in and put them on one of the carts. I will wave at you from a distance. You're welcome to then go home. Or if you'd like to financially give in some way to support the outreach, you're welcome to go to the link uh, on the advertisement for the food drive that's on our Facebook pages. It takes you directly to a donation page for the church. You can just put in their community outreach. I promise you this, 100% of every dime that you put in there for community outreach goes directly to helping the residents of the community. Nothing goes to staffing or to expenses or anything of the sort. 100% of it will purchase food that goes directly to those who need it. And so we encourage you to support uh, the church in that way. Um, let's go on with our lesson for today. A little bit of background for this is again the season of Easter. We're reading these great stories of the resurrection. This last Sunday we read the story about Thomas. And so we focus more on him. I'd like to study what happens right before Thomas, however, because Jesus reveals himself to the disciples before he, uh, the other ten disciples, before he reveals himself to Thomas. If you remember, Thomas wasn't there on that very first night in that upper room. And so let me turn to the Gospel of John. We're looking at the 20th chapter. You're welcome to follow along. We'll start with the 19th verse. On the evening of that day, again, the day of the resurrection, the first day, the first day of the week, the doors were shut. The disciples were there for fear of the Jews. And Jesus then came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were very glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus then said again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so send I you. Even when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If they retain the sins of any, they are retained. Did you hear that last verse? God has given us authority and a responsibility about forgiveness. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That is what we call the office of the keys. We have been given the keys of the kingdom. And that is kind of an amazing thing. Not kind of, it's a spectacular thing. We have God's authority because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's sealed by the gift of the Holy Spirit to be ambassadors of God. And when we offer God's forgiveness, it is as though God has given it. You know, every Sunday we do a thing called the passing of the peace in our traditional worship service. And I tell folks, you're not just wishing people peace. You're not saying, oh, I hope you have peace in your life. Good for you. You're actually giving peace. You've been given peace by God, and you, it's, peace is like a substance. You then pass that peace on to somebody else in God's name. You have the authority to do that. You're giving them something substantial 
The same thing is true here with the Office of the Keys. You are giving them something substantial. You are giving them something of substance. You are giving them forgiveness. It is sealed by God's authority. That's a powerful thing. See, because words are meaningful. They're not just meaningless. Oh, peace. I hope you have some peace in your life. No, you're giving God's peace. You're giving God's forgiveness. Because words are powerful. They mean something. They have the power to heal and bind people up. Or they have the power to tear them down. You know, we have this idiotic phrase. Children's song. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Call me this, call me that. Call yourself a scaredy cat. It, it just isn't true. Words do hurt. They do wound. Or they can heal and they can bind up. Because words carry power. When I was growing up, I grew up in a really destructive household. Uh, my mom remarried. My stepfather was not a nice person. I was beaten many times, beat unconscious on multiple occasions. But those wounds healed. But I can tell you what didn't heal, not for a long time, were the words that he said to me. You're stupid. You're no good. You're an idiot. You're a bum. Lots of other worse words, quite frankly. And those words were banging around in my head for years and years and years and years, and they tore me down. Words are powerful. You say words to people, they tear people down. It is also true that your words can bind people up and bring them healing. Today's lesson, the Office of Keys, is about binding them up, healing them, giving them peace, and giving to them God's forgiveness. So, now you notice, though, that this, this lesson says that you have the authority not just to forgive, but also to retain the sins of others. And you've got to ask yourself, well, why in the world would I ever retain somebody's sin? Why would you hold that from somebody? Is there anything that anybody's done to you that's not worthy of your forgiveness or God's forgiveness? I mean, think about anything that somebody's done to you. I bet you've done the, that to them or to somebody else in your lifetime, and maybe even worse, and yet people have been willing to forgive you. So the question is, if you've been forgiven, why would you ever retain the sins of somebody else? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Shouldn't we be as kind and forgiving others as we have been forgiven by God? There is absolutely nothing that you've done that God hasn't been willing to forgive. So why would you ever retain the sins of any? So let me list for you, first of all, those whom Jesus withholds forgiveness. There's only three. Three examples. Religious leaders <laughs> who love power and wealth more than they love God. I was just reminded of this. Um, <laughs> here we are in this situation. Apparently, I, I don't know. I haven't checked this out, and I don't know how, the veracity of this, but apparently there's some television evangelist who's asked everybody in his church and everybody who listens to him to give their stimulus checks to him. Not to God, not to be a blessing to others, but to him and to his ministry. Well, his ministry is basically him preaching on TV and taking home millions for his house, I guess. He's got his mortgage due. Uh, God doesn't care for that very much. That is not of God. Now, again, I, I could be wrong about this person's motives. Maybe he's trying to collect it to give to other people. I don't know. So I don't want to indict somebody needlessly. But Jesus is always very harsh on religious leaders who surround themselves with wealth at the expense of those whom they are called to love and to shepherd. So that's the number one people from whom Jesus withholds forgiveness. Number two people are people who are unwilling to forgive. We see that in Matthew chapter 5, 22 and 6, 14. And the third group of people are those who've known the graces and the goodness of God, but spit upon those blessings. And that you can find in Matthew 10, chapter 33. A couple other examples, Matthew 25, 14 to 29. Three different examples, and they're basically all the same people. Religious leaders, typically. 
But then if you take a look at the list of people whom Jesus was willing to forgive, that list is long and it's exhaust and not I could never exhaust that list. He uh, Jesus is willing to uh, forgive people who harmed him. Jesus forgave his enemies. Jesus forgave non-religious people who weren't even Jews. By the way, they didn't follow his religion. Selfish and corrupt public officials, he was willing to forgive them. People who are helpless, rebellious people, Jesus forgave. Prostitutes, dishonest people, Jesus forgave. Those who came to God at the very last minute of their life and the last breath, God, Jesus forgave. Good people, bad people alike, at least how we would label good and bad people. As I said to you, people from other religions. Rich people. I know there are a lot of us who think God never forgives rich people. God does love and forgive rich people. The unrighteous people. Wealthy and dishonest public officials, although not wealthy and dishonest religious leaders. Criminals convicted of capital crimes. Judas, even after Judas had betrayed him to death, Jesus was holding the sup and willing to forgive him. Peter, after he denied Jesus for a third time. Boy, that's a pretty darn good list. Is there anybody who's done something to you that's not on that list? My bet is that anything that anybody has done to you is on that list and something that Jesus was willing to forgive. So who should we forgive? Well, I think anyone who asks. And even those who don't ask. Oh, you see, because that's the other miraculous thing about Jesus. Not only did Jesus forgive people who asked for forgiveness, but he forgave people before they even knew enough to ask for forgiveness. I am convinced that Jesus' forgiveness is given before we come to repentance. So I want to make sure you get this straight. This is probably the most important thing. We are forgiven, therefore... We repent. Repentance doesn't get forgiveness. Forgiveness brings repentance. Because we don't even know that we need to be forgiven. And yet Jesus, while we were what? Yet sinners, died for us on the cross. We are forgiven, therefore we repent. There are a lot of Christian people who get this wrong. They think, I repent, and then God will forgive me. That's not how it works. You're forgiven, therefore you repent. This sets up for us the only reason why we should ever withhold forgiveness from somebody. We announce it to them. We say it's available for you, but there's also a call to repentance. The repentance, again, doesn't earn a person forgiveness. But the only time the disciples ever did that was in, as an example or as a testimony. Look, God is forgiven. I'm withholding it from you for right now just so you can learn from this. So there were some cases where disciples gave direction to people who needed to come to repentance. They didn't withhold uh, repentance because they were, had a grudge against them. You never hear or see Jesus or any of the disciples withholding forgiveness because they've got a grudge against somebody, because they have a vendetta against somebody. That would be an inappropriate use of the office of the keys. They would only do it for educational purposes, the opportunity to reconcile somebody to Jesus Christ. But we need to remember that forgiveness always precedes repentance even in your life. Don't tell me you repented and then were forgiven because you didn't even know enough to repent until Jesus was willing to forgive you. So I believe that this passage does not mean what we think it is means. It doesn't mean that you've been given the right 
and the office keys to sign people to heaven or hell. That's God's job. You don't have the right to determine whether somebody is worthy or not of receiving forgiveness. Nobody's worthy of receiving forgiveness. It reminds me of one of my favorite stories. And again, I'm, I've said this multiple times. I'm not sure whether it's a true story or, or, or an apocryphal story about Napoleon. And he had a soldier that he was going to have executed because he had abandoned his post. And the mother came up to Napoleon and said, Please have mercy, forgive my son, have mercy upon my son. To which Napoleon is reputed to have said, Your son doesn't deserve forgiveness and mercy. To which the mother replied, Well, if he deserved mercy and forgiveness, it wouldn't be mercy and forgiveness, would it? See, nobody deserves forgiveness. Nobody deserves mercy, but God gives it to us anyway. Why? Because he loves us and he adores us. So I want you to remember that you hold in your hands the office of the keys. You have the power to build somebody up. You have the power to announce God's forgiveness even if they haven't repented, even if they don't even know they need to repent, you know, God loves you and wants to, has reconciled you to him. Can you imagine if we as the church led with that message? God loves you. And God has reconciled you to him. So it's saying, you need to repent before you can receive Jesus in your heart. What if we led with, you know what? God loves you and has reconciled you to him because you are so precious. Do you see the difference in the message? That's what it means to have the office of the keys. We have the power that is backed by the authority of God to build people up for the kingdom's sake. We are called to shepherd the unreconciled back into relationship with God, and therefore we are to lead with forgiveness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks that it is forgiveness that comes to us before we even know enough to repent. Now, you have given us those keys, the power to announce that forgiveness. And it's just like you announcing that forgiveness to us. There is power behind those words. You are forgiven. God has reconciled you. We are set free. And now, God, we repent, not because we have to to earn God's pleasure, but because we understand what that forgiveness has cost you. And we don't want to hurt you again. We don't repent to get forgiveness. We repent because we have been forgiven. And so, God, you've called us to hold on to that office of the keys and offer that forgiveness to others. Let us forgive generously as we have been forgiven. For he asks us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Look upon him with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.